So uh, welcome everyone uh, to the 2021 Tadori Kalanen Lecture. Um, it's Professor Kevin Turner, I'm Chair of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's my pleasure today uh, uh, to host this lecture in which uh, Ji Gong Suo of Harvard University uh, will, will discuss some of his latest work with us. Before we get to the, the seminar, I did want to uh, just tell everybody a little bit about this endowed lecture series. Uh, this is the only endowed lecture series in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics. And uh, we have uh, typically one speaker a year um, selected um, through an exhaustive process uh, from the faculty. And we're, we're very fortunate to have this endowed lecture. And um, the lecture was endowed uh, by Leticia, uh, uh, Tadori Kalanen. Uh, she went by Letty uh, when she was in the program here. She was an uh, undergraduate graduate of the department in 1983. And she endowed the Tadori Kalanen lecture series and meme in honor of her late father, Fred Tadori Sr., um, who, quote, always, always placed such an emphasis on education and strongly encouraged his daughters to become engineers. And Letty would joke that he succeeded with, with three of the four of his daughters in, in, in that goal. Um, in addition to endowing uh, this lecture series in mechanical engineering, uh, she also donated the founding gift to SEAS to establish Advancing Women in Engineering. Um, Letty was a, a very active student while at Penn. Um, uh, she worked on many projects during her undergraduate studies at Penn, uh, exhibiting great curiosity, creativity, diligence, responsibility, and attention to detail all while maintaining one of the highest academic records in the department. Uh, this is a picture of Letty with um, one of our colleagues who's still here today, Professor Noam Lior is pictured here. So Noam, if you're on the line, um, uh, this must be from the, the early 1980s. And while at Penn Engineering, among the projects that Letty took part in was developing and running SolarO, which was the first solar heated retrofitted house in Philadelphia. Um, this is a picture of the house at 3920 Spruce, Spruce Street. You can see the solar panels on the roof there. And um, this was a, a large part of her, her work um, as a student researcher in the department. Um, she also designed uh, and constructed a sophisticated experimental facility for studying the effects of wind on thermal solutile behavior of soft radiant solar ponds in the mean wind tunnel. So uh, we're very fortunate that Letty um, had such a, a great experience in the department and decided to endow this lecture, which has hosted uh, just a, a very large number of distinguished speakers over the years. Um, today, it's, it's our pleasure to have Jigang Suo, who is the Allen E. and Marilyn M. Puckett Professor of Mechanics and Materials at Harvard University, um, as our Tadori Kalanen Lecture. Uh, Ji Gang earned a bachelor's degree from Jian Jiaotong University in 1985, a PhD degree from Harvard University in 1989. Uh, he joined the faculty of the University of California at Santa Barbara in 1989. And then for some reason, he left uh, the sunny beaches and, and mountains of Santa Barbara uh, to, to move to Princeton University in 1997. And then he moved on to Harvard University where he currently is at in 2003. His research is broadly in the mechanical behavior of materials, and he's touched on uh, systems ranging from the fracture of brittle materials, such as ceramics and microelectronic materials, to soft materials more recently, which we'll see today. Jigang uh, is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Humboldt Research Award, uh, the Pi Tau Sigma Gold Medal, and the Special Achievement Award for Young Investigators in Applied Mechanics, uh, from, both from ASME, he also received the, the Prager Medal from the Society of Engineering Science, and he's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Um, he's had a, a very significant impact on the mechanics community over his career. Um, you know, beyond his groundbreaking research accomplishments, he's also been very active in promoting and developing the mechanics field. Um, with Tang Li, he co-founded iMechanica, a very popular website uh, and a blog for discussion of mechanics uh, topics among mechanicians. Um, uh, as of 2015, uh, which is a bit outdated now, it had over 20,000 registered users, and I'm sure there are many more today. He's also been active in the Applied Mechanics Division of the ASME and the U.S. National Committee on Theoretical and Applied Mechanics. 
Um, so Zhigong has done foundational work in fracture mechanics um, with applications ranging from microelectronics to composites to stretchable electronics. And more recently, his efforts have shifted to a focus on soft materials um, with a particular emphasis on tough hydrogels and studying their fracture and failure properties. And uh, I'm pleased that uh, we have Zhigong here today and he will give a lecture entitled uh, Resisting Fatigue uh, by deconcentrating stress. So Jigan, I'll turn it over to you to share your screen. Let me stop sharing here. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for the nice introduction. I'll try to, uh, this will stop other, okay, continue. Right. There we go. All right, and uh, share. Okay, you see the screen now? We do. Okay, good. Thank you so much for, for hosting this uh, special lecture. Um, so the title today is uh, Resist Fatigue by Deconcentrating Stress. I add one more word, elastically. It turns out I just thought yesterday this word is crucial. Uh, I won't unpack these words uh, now, but uh, we'll move on. I post all the slides online at Twitter, my name at Shigang So uh, the slides are also connect uh, to all the references uh, online. All right, so let's move on. Oh, right. So uh, broadly um, for mechanical behaviors, uh, when we teach the subject, when we learn the subject and we're in everyday life, uh, we know about a glass is a brittle, uh, steel is uh, tough. It can undergo plastic deformation. And a rubber looks very different. It is, uh, can have a large deformation and it's elastic. So these are the behaviors um, are, of course, uh, people know about uh, for, for, for a thousand years, maybe not rubber, but certainly for glass and uh, steel, many, many years. Rubber is more recent, uh, maybe 200 years of history people studying it. So now, uh, this picture, our uh, slide to summarize uh, uh, at high level or at lowest level, uh, 100 years of toughness uh, today, uh, this year, uh, it was 100 years of celebration of a Griffiths uh, foundational paper. I made a long tweet, it's uh, still ongoing, uh, about uh, about individual papers that I read, I felt impacted the field. So here I selected three pieces of work. They're really the pillars of a fracture uh, of all kinds of materials. Now, starting with Griffith, for people who study fractures, this of course is a paper you need to study. For other people, uh, you can get gist of this uh, by looking at this figure. So now glass is, uh, we know, brittle material uh, at a molecular atomic level. It's just atom connected by covalent bond. So fracture means a crack going through this material by breaking a layer of atomic bonds. All the other atomic bonds in the material remain uh, elastic. So therefore you break a layer of atomic bonds the toughness, toughness is energy, joule, uh, for extending crack by unit area, meter squared, one joule per meter squared. Uh, next page, I'll explain where this number comes from. This number turns out to be quite universal. It's uh, good for all materials, uh, all solid materials, and you'll see why. Uh, it's uh, roughly uh, on the same order magnitude, right? Then the next piece of work, actually important work, was uh, Irwin and Orwan, two separate papers. Uh, answer why steel, copper, aluminum, these um, um, uh, metals, and later plastics, why these materials are tough, meaning you need to uh, spend more energy to grow a crack. Here I draw a picture for a polymer system, but uh, these gentlemen really focus on uh, metals. But the story is the same. 
So what happens is uh, before you break atomic bonds here, let's say here is a polymer chain uh, in metal, metal <laughs> or yeah, in, 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 in tough material, before you break any bonds, you can have a substantial amount of plastic deformation. So dissipate energy in the bulk. So this size scale could be millimeter, could be even centimeter, much larger than individual atom size. So, so you dissipate a lot of energy through these plastic uh, deformation. Toughness could be any number. Uh, here I just uh, list a representative number. It could be million, could be 10 million, uh, right, two per meter squared. So in the field, we know toughness really has no upper bound because of water has infinite toughness because of water does not grow a crack. So, so these number become almost meaningless. Uh, so high, so it becomes so irrelevant. Uh, all right, so now there's a piece of work, Lake Thomas, 1967 piece of work is remarkable. This is a piece of work I seek to amplify today in today's lecture. It's usually not covered in conventional fraction mechanics course or just any fraction mechanics course. Uh, it's not clear why it is not. Um, yeah, I, I will push for everybody teach fracture, need to read this paper and teach it. Uh, so this is, holds a secret of anti-fatigue, essentially. All right, so now this paper, uh, I'll have a few more pages about this paper. And the whole talk is about amplification of this paper, but briefly. So what they have, these gentlemen work on rubber like a material. So you have a polymer chains. So polymer chains have two important attributes for generalization. One is along the chain, the bond is strong in this case, a covalent bond. And between the chain, the interaction is very weak much weaker than along the bond. That allows stress deconcentration, deconcentration, why? So one crack coming in, before this uh, chain break, uh, this chain, the entire chain will under high stress. When this chain break, it only break at a single atomic bond, the entire chain energy is released because of stress deconcentration. In this case, deconcentrated from a single bond to the entire chain, maybe even a few neighboring chains. This process is not available in, in glass. So as a result, you have to snap a layer of a chains, not a single bond anymore. You only break one bond, but you dissipate energy in the single the entire layer. So the toughness immediately amplify by number of bonds, right? So, so you can see why this is important. All right, so in this process, in this uh, most elementary process, there's a zero plasticity involved. That holds the secret of a high fatigue resistance. Everything available is available to you in single load and in infinite number of loads, load cycles. All right, so let's move on. Now, incidentally, uh, all the talks uh, or all the papers are cited uh, linked to the original sources. And uh, this is a set of slides are, are available on Twitter. All right, so let's move on. Ah, I want to <laughs> explain to you why this one joule per meter square, this order's magnitude is for all materials without exception, uh, all covalent bonded material. So it happens because uh, all covalent materials are governed by uh, a single thing, it's an electron. In the world, our world is, uh, is a very poor world because there's only one type of electron. Okay, so this insight was uh, realized in uh, Bohr, uh, this is more than, um, so, uh, so Griffiths should know this work, uh, didn't cite this work, but Griffith's paper, if you read his original paper, every line has a word molecule in it. So molecule around this time must be a hot word like soft material today or MEMS, 
20 years ago. You have to use this word. So, so Griffiths himself doesn't really understand, didn't show any understanding of quantum mechanics. The basic, of course, uh, the theory was in uh, 26, but nowadays we understand this number just exclusively in the sense. There's no other way to understand it. So uh, now this is a, I list this is a Schrodinger equation for a simplest uh, a model uh, hydrogen atom, a single proton and a single electron. Uh, but the equation with even with a generalization has similar structure. In particular, they have the same uh, quantities involved. So that's an uh, electron charge, uh, permittivity, epsilon zero, and mass of electrons. These are universal constants. And also, uh, of course, H bar. So because uh, there are three terms in this thing, um, it defines a length scale. Okay, so these two guys define a length scale and also compares them. These two will define an energy scale. So this equation, single equation has both energy and length scale for hydrogens. So you, you, you solve this, but even if you don't solve it by just by dimensional analysis, you have the right dimension. All right, so, and then use these numbers. You have to modify these number a little bit because the hydrogen is a little peculiar, very small and very energetic. The hydrogen bond, uh, not hydrogen bond, hydrogen, um, uh, the atomic bond is uh, very strong because it's small. If you just scale it a little bit, you get this one joule per meter squared. So it is a property of an electron essentially, uh, nothing else. Okay, uh, so therefore it is uh, essentially futile to try to design tough material by learning quantum mechanics because it doesn't matter whether you understand or not, you do not modify it. You cannot modify it. Okay, so that's not the field, uh, uh, the, the action of the field. The field of action for many decades <laughs> is an elaboration of this insight from Erwin and Orwell. <clears throat> Two papers published in 1948. Uh, the insight summarized in a single sentence, his races enhance toughness. So we already know, so here's a stress stretch or strain curve. Uh, so when you apply a force and you have displacement and there's a nonlinear, when you unload the reduce the force, uh, the the loading curve loading curve and unloading curve are separated and this is a work for energy dissipated so and uh, if you look at a crack running in such a material in such a material as a crack propagate way ahead of the crack you are kind of like here elastic your a here and uh, then way behind the crack uh, your d so through this process there's a material particle as a crack move forward, a material particle will undergo this hysteresis, uh, hysteresis and dissipate this energy. Now, the point is this zone is a macroscopic. It's not atomic scale anymore, uh, typically on the order of millimeter to centimeters for steel. That's so release enormous amount of energy. So all the fraction mechanical principle of it has been just the elaboration of this single sentence. Okay, that's good. Um, today, I will not elaborate this. Um, it's a still ongoing process, uh, theme. Now, I want to spend more time on this Lake Thomas model. It's almost like often, the paper is not extremely highly cited. It's well cited, but it's a disproportion to its contribution. It's underlying uh, polymer fracture. The single paper really underlined all polymer fracture. Okay, so for, but these gentlemen were working on elastomer. So they have two insights. So I have two pages. Insight number one, polymer chains enhance toughness. You don't need to go plasticity, just chain itself. So why? Because uh, you need to break this chain. And this chain, oh, this is, here's a chain, this chain uh, is a very strong covalent bond, as strong as uh, glass. It's a carbon bond, carbon carbon bond, as strong as any covalent bond. But in between chains, one chain and another chain, the interaction is weak. 
It's by, let's say, Van der Waals interaction. Therefore, when chains uh, is stretched, the entire chain has the same, practically the same tension. When this chain break, the entire chain lose its energy. Therefore, the energy, so I won't explain this, uh, this symbol, but this is energy per unit area is uh, energy. So this is uh, energy um, per unit uh, volume. So this is uh, uh, times, uh, uh, time, not per unit volume. So this is uh, energy per bound. This is energy per monomer. So this has a unit of energy uh, per volume. You need to times the uh, entire thickness, sorry. Thickness, this is a thickness is a B. B is a, a length per monomer and N, N is a number of monomer along the chain. You take square root because uh, the chain is going through random uh, walk. So this is a thickness of that layer. So this is the length. So this is energy per volume, energy per volume, thickness of a single layer, chain layer, and that give you energy per area. That's how much energy you need. So now, and uh, let's go on. Um, now this is inside one. Uh, inside number two, you have, uh, so let me summarize this. that hysteresis does not enhance fatigue threshold. So fatigue by threat, fatigue is the following. You still have the crack, same, same sample, but you do cyclic loading. What you measure is a crack uh, extension per cycle. So this is a crack growth per cycle uh, as a function of uh, applied load. Here is this uh, energy per uh, unit area. So, and uh, we know that process of chain breaking is an elastic process until it breaks. So that process is unaffected by cycle loading. So you still have that for rubber, it's a 50 joule per meter squared. That number was reported uh, by these gentlemen uh, <laughs> so many years ago, more than a half century ago. If you measure rubber today, natural rubber today, it's still this number has not been enhanced. So uh, now if you have a hysteresis, low hysteresis, high hysteresis, you only change the slope of this curve, but there's a threshold, this is called a threshold. The threshold is uh, the, the energy below which no extension of a crack. Above, you always have extension. So hysteresis does not enhance uh, fatigue threshold. Yeah. All right, so these are two insights from this paper. Um, now, so now come to a more modern uh, work. There's a 203 work, landmark work for soft material. Uh, this is a, a lady. Uh, she's a, a big professor now in Japan. Uh, so she, uh, create this uh, double network gel. It has two networks, blue network and a red network. There's a blue network is, has a short chain and a red network has a long chain. So, and under load, uh, this blue chain will break uh, before long chain break. So this blue chain break dissipate a lot of energy over large volume on the order, in her case, maybe 100 micron in size. So her toughness reached uh, uh, more than 1,000 joule per meter squared. So here is a, a photo. If you use a regular gel under mechanical compression, they break like tofu. And it's, this is her double network gel. And you press this, it looks like a pancake. And if you release load, the pancakes stand up again. So very tough material. All right, so that's 2003. Uh, I heard about this work uh, around uh, 2008. I had to get a talk on this kind of thing. Uh, but our own paper published in 12. So um, we made our version of a similar idea with some twist. Uh, so, but then we have a model system to study various kinds of things using this material. Uh, so, um, so our material also has two network. One network is a polyacrylamide. I'll use a lot. Polyacrylamide almost like a glass. 
in the sense it's a very elastic, but it's a stretchable hydrogel. It's widely used, synthesized by many labs in the world. So it's a very good model material. We use this material. So this material is elastic. If you have a crack going through, you break a chain at a single bond, relax energy along the entire chain. So the fracture energy is 100 joule per meter square on this order. Uh, so another gel we use is alginate, come from seaweed. So it has a long chain. Uh, the chains are not covalent crosslink. Oh, this, this thing is covalently crosslink. This chain is uh, alginate is ionically crosslink. When crack move forward, this chain will unzip. Uh, but but the cracks just unzip a single layer of uh, uh, ionic bond. All these other bonds remain zipped. So in this case, the plastic zone is small. You don't dissipate a uh, lot of energy. 10 joule per meter squared, kind of like tofu, hopeless. All we did is uh, combine these material at molecular level. So when this crack move, break, before you break this alginate covalent bond chain, you unzip large volume of alginate ionic bond. So the plastic zone is on the order of centimeters in our case. And therefore this energy is enormous. So we call in the field, we call a brittle, brittle, brittle material, brittle material, and you just blend them, it become a tough material. So this strategy has been extensively used by many other groups. The chemistry can be arbitrary, so people recognize. So this paper has made a good impact in, in that sense. Uh, people, all, everybody has their, their own model material now. Uh, so now just give you some sense of this material. So this material is highly stretchable, is transparent. You can see the black background and it can be stretched 21 times. And, uh, and then if you cut a crack, uh, this crack, can open up, so you stretch 17 times, the crack open up, but does not advance. So in that way, you have a high toughness because uh, toughness is measured by energy needed for crack to advance. In this case, the crack doesn't advance. All right, so uh, you compare tofu, we mentioned 10 joule per meter squared. Mo most gels, uh, 10 joule per meter squared, contact lenses, 100, and cartridge, 1,000, natural rubber 10,000. So these are the scale, like earthquake scale of uh, numbers. So now, then that's test one. So we're mechanical people, we have multiple tests with the material. Test two is measuring hysteresis. So we have uh, uh, the, um, so just a cyclic load this, the material has an enormous hysteresis and because this material, once you unzip, the material does not rezip easily. We can rezip it by heating it up, heal it. So, so the next cycle, it, uh, it doesn't have huge hysteresis. So the material is tough for first cycle and degrade in subsequent cycle. So this is a hysteresis is bad in the applications. We recognized a long time ago, but uh, 17, we published a paper really critique our own materials. Uh, and uh, furthermore, this is really damaging to our reputation, uh, fatigue. So then we measure the cyclic uh, loading, measure the crack growth, DCDN, the growth per cycle. So then this threshold is only 50. Remember toughness is on the order of 10,000. So this material is as embarrassing as natural rubber, or as good as natural rubber, if you want to have a positive spin. Uh, 50 uh, threshold is low. And we understand it because a large amount of um, uh, toughness really comes from hysteresis. And Lake Thomas already told you, hysteresis does not enhance threshold in the same sense that metal is a fatigue prone, metal. All right. So, and, uh, and, and then we also uh, learned to make uh, Jianping Gong's uh, double network gel. Her material is much better than ours. Uh, with a great reluctance, we published that result as well. 
Uh, so she is our hero. And her threshold, threshold uh, could be as high as uh, you know, 200, 300 joule per minute squared. And we learned it is because her red network is very long, much longer than ours net, uh, long chain. Her red network is also polyacrylamide, very long. And uh, so this really correlate, the threshold really correlate with the square root of chain length as predicted by Lake Thomas model. Lake Thomas already told you, threshold only has something to do with the chain length. Right. Okay, so with that insight, uh, we uh, try to learn, um, uh, address a fundamental question of, uh, of uh, uh, polymers, uh, polymer network. It's called a stiffness threshold conflict. Uh, the conflict goes in the following way. So here's the stiffness, stiffness, oh, stiffness in the sense of modulus, let's say, elastic modulus. And the threshold I just mentioned, if uh, you want to have a threshold high, you need to have modulus no, low, why? Because these scalings, the modulus, this is a shear modulus, uh, same as a, a Young's modulus, scale with one over N, N is a number of monomers. If you have a very long chains, the material become softer intuitively, right? And we also learned from Lake Thomas, the threshold scale is a square root of n. So these in different places. So now uh, for hydrogel, it's a here very low. I said it's about 10 joule per meter squared, can be even lower if you want to make it stiffer. Uh, so like tofu, uh, really, uh, really uh, brittle. Uh, for elastomers, you're doing a little better, uh, like a rubber, natural rubber, 50 joule per meter squared, but it is still suffers this uh, correlation. There is a one to one half log log plot, right? So um, now we say, now if you have a double network, you actually remove this conflict because you have resources, you have two networks. So single network, you have this constraint, but if you double network A and B, two network, network A, network B, you can use A network to do stiffness, make an A network really short chain, very stiff, and make B network very long, the highest fatigue threshold. So that's how this double network work. They serve distinct functions to networks. All right, so that's very good. Uh, then, uh, so now this is our own data, you can see the single network gel is pathetic here and a double network gel, it rivals the elastomer. Even though gel, a hydrogel contains 90% of water, water doesn't carry load. It can be as good as elastomer. All it takes is to have long chains. All right, so and then we try to uh, generalize uh, this idea. Uh, deconcentrate stress elastically. The key insight from Lake Thomas is not about a polymer chain. It's about the mechanics. So we say, no, uh, how about I just make a macroscopic fiber? So here is a PDMS uh, fiber. It's a stretchable. And here is another PDMS matrix. Matrix is more compliant than fiber. Both are stretchable. Now, this fiber and this fiber are decoupled if your matrix is really soft, right? So meaning if you have a crack here and here I mark a square. Uh, so this square will, will shear significantly because this material is soft so that uh, you can spread high stress over long uh, segment fiber. In our case, millimeter to centimeter scale. So this is a deconcentrated stress just by have some elastic thing in it, very soft thing in it. So as a result, your toughness is a WF, WF is whatever work of fracture, uh, this area underneath the stress stretch curve of this hard material, this is a hard PDMS, um, at times of whatever the length scale you can scrap, uh, spread because the H can be macroscopic now, millimeter, 
it's not limited to fiber uh, individual polymer chain anymore. So you can design your material have arbitrarily high fatigue threshold, arbitrarily high. Okay, so that's the insight. So this paper has been doing very well. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't uh, yeah, need to tell you how to make this. It's a rudimentary, you just make fiber, cut them, and then, uh, then, then uh, cast the matrix around. It's very easy to do this material. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah. So to some extent, uh, Irwin and Orong spread a fake news. They said toughness is a correlate to his races. That was a fake news, or it's a partially fake news. Uh, many materials do behave this way. Uh, if you have a low hysteresis, you have a low toughness. Uh, pure PDMS, for example, has a low toughness. And uh, our material, polyacrylamide alginate hydrogel, has high hysteresis, high, high toughness. That's good. That's correlation. Obey uh, uh, Erwin Erwin. But also exceptional material, this new material, PDMS, composite, as a modern, modern material, it has a very low hysteresis because both material PDMS has no history, very low hysteresis, on below 10%. Uh, but the toughness can be as high as you want, as high as you want. Okay, so uh, that's good. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, so uh, then we also make another version of material matrix and the fiber. Matrix is a very soft hydrogel, but very elastic. Uh, fiber is uh, stiffer, but still elastic. And we measure the threshold. This is a, uh, the energy release rate as a function of the cycle. We can go to very high cycle, even when energy release rate is on the order of a kilojoule per meter square, 1000. This is just a demonstration. There, there is no theoretical limit to how high you can go now. Because the length scale is whatever you put in. Right, uh, how you design it. So um, that's very good. Uh, so and uh, this uh, um, this uh, uh, compare uh, the material. At that point, we wrote this paper. Uh, our material is the tallest, but now this has soon surpassed because there's no upper bound. You can uh, you can push this material. Yeah, this is a plot of toughness or threshold has a uh, yeah a toughness plane. Uh, threshold will not. We go beyond toughness, but both toughness and threshold can be higher. So you can occupy anywhere on this uh, lower triangle, right? So this number is, uh, so uh, uh, 10,000, you, you can go higher. There's no real upper bound. Uh, but there are several independent, almost independent work by us and, uh, and other people. Now for a single given material PVA, or uh, the toughness uh, and the threshold has to go way beyond even 1,000 joule per meter square. Now, if you're a mechanical engineer, professor, have to teach fatigue, fatigue has long been regarded as a black box. You design around it and you, des you do not design of it. Now you can design to dramatically, essentially remove fatigue from consideration. It's possible now at least for this class of material. So uh, we are very excited. We and many other people very excited. Finally, we touch the fundamental of a mechanical engineering fatigue. Uh, so I don't have time to talk about this, but essentially it says uh, the principle is not about a fiber. It's about any microstructure. And all you need to do is make microstructure feature size big and have a, uh, uh, you know, modulus contrast so that you can spread high stress over larger length scale defined by whatever scale you de uh, design, right? So here we just use 3D printing to just make the point. Uh, of course, this work, so whenever we publish the work, we, we do limited research uh, on literature. Our point always appear higher. By now this point, at least by latest research, this is all way surpassed. People done much good work. So uh, yeah, the latest paper, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Chris Tang published another paper. Uh, he tested a commercially available polyurethane elastomer, the fatigue threshold 
is already on the order of several thousand joule per meter squared. He said in his paper, he couldn't find a literature before about fatigue threshold of these or, or any polyurethane uh, of this value. So we didn't find it uh, when we published our paper. So we actually use spandex. Spandex fiber is a very good fiber. It's polyurethane. And we have another polyurethane, soft polyurethane as matrix. We made an elastomer composite. When we publish our paper, our point, of course, is the highest, several thousand. But even then we knew, it is, in principle, you can be as high as you want. It all the matter is to pay attention. All right. So, and uh, then we also recently published a paper about uh, this inside, old inside, people know about it. Uh, solid glass, we know, learned from, uh, we learned from everyone, it's brittle. But a fabric glass is tough. Why the same reason? Because a fabric glass, you can distribute stress over long distance, macroscopic distance. The toughness of a fabric easily go to 1,000, 10,000 joule per meter square. Yeah, with the same brittle glass. That nails the point uh, clearly. So one cute thing about this paper, I think it's new. It says uh, uh, even this uh, fabric suffer fatigue. Suffer fatigue. All right. So now, uh, so how much time do I have? So I won't have too much time. It's uh, such a disgrace. Uh, last week, we published a paper in is, is science. It uh, really took a long time to get this paper published. Uh, it's very exciting, but let's just describe the basic insight without all the uh, results. You can read this paper, very short paper, very easy to read. Okay, so here is uh, another, I think it's a fundamental insight can have a broad impact uh, to the field. Uh, so here we think about uh, compare crosslinks and entanglements. So we already said crosslink. So for example, here's a crosslink. It's a one polymer chain. There's a red chain, uh, can uh, covalently bond with other chains. That's crosslink. But uh, this uh, red chain can also interact with other chain by this entanglement. This entanglement. Uh, is a topological, cannot distangle, uh, but it can slip, can slip easily. Uh, so, so here's a summarize uh, the basic insight. Crosslinks and entanglements both stiffen and elastic uh, polymer. If you just stretch it, so this, this uh, entanglement and this crosslink almost function the same thing. They stiffen the material, make the material stiff. However, here's another insight. Crosslinks in brittle and elastomer, we just said, right? If you make a lot of crosslinks, the chain becomes short, your toughness go down. However, entanglement do not in brittle material. So why? Because uh, here's the entanglement. Uh, the polymer chain can slip. So before this uh, chain break, uh, the entire tension is transmitted through the entire, along the entire chain across the entanglement. Entanglement does not break the transmission of high tension. When this chain break at a single atomic bond, the entire chain lose energy, right? So now, so this paper is a, a play this game. So, uh, yeah, I won't have time to how we make it. It's a very easy to make it, but you can see the result. Um, so this is a, a highly entangled hydrogel, look like a stand-up citizen. Uh, here is a regular hydrogel with a long chain, so floppy, hopeless. Uh, and also, um, yeah, I don't have time to talk about basic physics. Uh, let me just so, so mention- Shigang, you yeah. probably have another five minutes if you'd like. Oh, oh okay, thank you. Thank you. Maybe I just go over this slide. Uh, Take your time. Yeah, uh, just um, <laughs> stiffness. So what we made is, um, um, yeah. So essentially we, uh, so uh, here is a measurement of stiffness as a function of a cross link. Uh, uh, yeah, the concentration of the cross link. 
Okay, if you have a high concentration of cross link, uh, the material uh, becomes stiff, right? You can see it becomes stiff, that's true. Normally, uh, people make this gel the uh, C value. This is a ratio between cross link, number of cross link to number of the monomers. So typically, you have a maybe 1,000 or 100 uh, monomers per chain. What we did is make chain so long or uh, on the order, in this case, uh, almost a million or half million uh, monomers per chain. Uh, if you make such a long chain, traditional hydrogel, regular hydrogel will be very floppy. But somehow we make this chain has so many entanglements. How many? Along the single chain, we have about a hundred entanglements. So. Uh, we give a name to this, uh, yeah, do we have a name? Yeah, oh, we, we, we have a name. The editor doesn't like this name. So we call it a tanglemer. Tanglemer is a polymer in which entanglements greatly outnumber crosslinks. The editor said, this phrase is good, explicit. This name, nobody knows what you're talking about. So, <laughs> so this name doesn't su survive in the paper, but we check it survived in one of the published videos. The edit didn't watch video carefully. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, we, yeah we, we, we didn't change that. Okay, all right. So uh, we have evidence to show we have a, uh, many, many entanglements. As a result, uh, let me just show you the result. So here is uh, another same plot, uh, toughness and uh, elast elastic modulus. Regular hydrogel suffers this uh, a conflict, toughness modulus conflict. It's here. And uh, if you use a highly entangled hydrogel, uh, you're, because of entanglements, uh, allow you keep up the high modulus just through entanglements. And you still use very long chains. So your toughness can still be very high. So in this case, this is a single network hydrogel achieve uh, yeah, a thousand joule per meter square toughness. This is a single network now. Okay, uh, so um, ah, this material is highly elastic, achieve uh, such a high toughness with uh, almost it's about 1% of uh, hysteresis. You can see loading and unloading. The hysteresis energy is about 1% of underneath the entire energy. It's a very, very low hysteresis. Okay, uh, so I don't have time for this uh, GMPS paper. So it's an interesting point. Yeah, slides are online, so we can discuss this. Um, this uh, hydrogel also has a very low uh, fatigue, uh, uh, friction coefficient, just because all these long chains on the surface stabilize a thick layer of water. On the surface, the chains are no longer entangled because uh, on the surface, chains are dangling. Um, so and that water really lowers, uh, uh, lowers the uh, frictional coefficient, one point. One, it's a kind of like our cartilage uh, of a joint. So uh, very good and uh, incredibly low wear rate. Wear rate. So uh, we're comparing nearly all materials except for a few few ex exceptions. But these guys have a high frictional coefficient. Anyway, so uh, that's uh, exciting. We also made this possible for elastic, not just for gel. All right. Uh, now, maybe I spend one minute on this. I don't have time for application at all today, but in the field, people are very enthusiastic about uh, polymer, not just for soft material, the entire field of polymer, because uh, uh, after one century of a polymer, people actually feel the need to reimagine polymers of all kinds, plastics, fibers, Gels, elastomers, all kinds. Why? Because imagine emerging applications, wearables, uh, tissue replacements, uh, soft robots, all these cool things academics want to use. But a society 
care less about this. They care about immediate challenge, this uh, plastic oceans. So we need to reduce, reuse, recycle, and biodegradable. You're talking about uh, better use existing polymers and also inventing new polymers. If you want a new polymer to replace polyethylene, the property need to be comparable to polyethylene. Right now, no newly developed polymer has that property. That's a mechanical property. So we're beginning to work on this. Very excited about this. Maybe next time we'll talk about this more, focus on this. All right, uh, let me just uh, uh, summarize. Today, I only want to deliver one message. Deconcentrate stress elastically in many ways. So I talk about these ways. Uh, this Lake Thomas way, the basic fundamental discovery more than half century ago, long chain deconcentrated stress. Uh, and uh, Jian Ping Gong, you use a double network to do that. Now we use a single network, we call it entanglement, use entanglement to do that. And uh, fabric, of course, have been doing this for millennium. Uh, this is a fiber composite uh, in recent century, but for soft material, it can also work. Of course, you can do other manufacturing processes. So I have to end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yigang, for a lovely talk. So we do have time for questions. Uh, as always, we encourage questions from students. I, I think given the number of people online, if you can raise your hand, I can call on you and then we can unmute. Pedro. Uh, Pedro, you're muted. Okay. Uh, a question, not about hydrogels, but um, about thermoplastic elastomers, right? Yeah. Thermoplastic elastomers are block polymers, and um, you use the self organizing properties of these materials, right, to uh, replace the cross links with entanglements, right? So, you know, they have lots of advantages. One of them is that you have a composite, right? A and a rubber uh, at the same time, right? You don't have to have your cross-link rubber and then put, you know, particles in it. So, so, so that's one advantage and, and, and it has interesting mechanical properties, but I never looked at the toughness. According to, to, the, to the theory that you have uh, presented, right? Um, these thermoplastic elastomers should have much better toughness properties than, than you know, um, carbon black reinforced rubbers. Is that is that right? Well, uh, it's a huge class. We talk about a thermoplastic elastomer. It's a huge class yeah. material. Um, so um, we look at the literature. The toughness is very high. Uh, there's a part, of, especially the polyurethane. So when we look at literature, uh, toughness was very high, but a threshold, fatigue threshold, is on the order of 100 joule per meter square below. Mm -hmm. um, but then Cretan, her great Cretan, he interact with industry people mm -hmm. and found two existing commercial polyurethane PPU. Mm -hmm. And he measured threshold uh, more than uh, four, uh, 4,000 joule per meter squared. He also had a very lovely principle. It is uh, these uh, chains, uh, because uh, in between chains, uh, they, it's known, can form a hydrogen bond. And these hydrogen bond, you can break apart during load and reform during the load. Mm -hmm. So, and they align up into essentially align up stiffer fiber in front of crack. Mm -hmm. So it's just, we believe it's the same principle. Yeah, it's like a double network as well. Yeah, right? yeah it's a self-assembled uh, stiff ligament mm -hmm. inside a soft material, and mm -hmm. that blocks the crack. It's a beautiful, the paper just published two weeks ago. So Kurtong, uh, yeah, you, you should click the, the link. It's a beautiful paper. Thank you. It's interesting. Yeah, the, the other thing about thermoplastic elastomers is that they're recyclable, right? You can heat them up and reuse them. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Chen Yang, Mo? 
Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, and it's very inspiring to hear your latest work. Um, so I have a particular question uh, in relates to fatigue threshold and toughness. And in particular, um, that we know that the fatigue threshold is limited by the toughness. But in a lot of work that you have shown, uh, the fatigue threshold is maybe one order or even sometimes two order lower uh, than toughness. And what is the reason behind that? And how can you, for example, design materials to have a uh, fatigue threshold on the same order uh, of uh, toughness? Excellent question. So traditionally, it's understood as follow. The toughness benefit tremendously by hysteresis, plasticity in the background over large volume, much larger than atomic dimension. Right? Metal does that, plastic does that. Uh, now, uh, so threshold does not benefit from uh, his races. So that's a traditional understanding. Now, we also tested our tanglemer, for example, and also our just a regular hydrogel. For these material, we still find one order magnitude lower threshold than toughness, very elastic material, with a hysteresis of less than 1%, uh, hysteresis uh, energy. So it's uh, um, unclear. The reason is unclear. Uh, so one speculation is the following. Um, so even for highly elastic gel, uh, the chains have different lengths so that some chain will break before other chains. Uh, so all these breaking, short chain and long chain can benefit toughness, but short chain does not benefit threshold. So this is our hunch, we published that. So um, there was a student at MIT, uh, just a bright individual from Shanghe's group, Shanghe Zhao's group. They published, uh, the student name is uh, Shao Ting Ling. They carefully made a network with equal length of a, a chain. Then they show the toughness and threshold almost coincide. Uh, I don't know if it's good or bad, I guess both are very low. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we have a question from Marwa. Hello. Hi. Can you Hi. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, first of all, thanks for this interesting talk. Uh, I'm curious about the design of the morphology. For for example, you mentioned the fiber. If you use, like, for example, very soft and stiff, this kind of significant young models uh, ratio. But when it comes to the molecular level that you go to for the, the chai, the chai itself, very, very long, for example, what is the correlation between the morphology, if we speak about how we put the material like very soft and very stiff, this combination to arrest the crack or force the crack to go in a certain way and versus we go for the molecular level? Which one, I, I, I'm really curious about this kind of, which one can be significant for achieving um, higher toughness? Should both of them use, which technique do you think is more interesting? Because uh, there, as far as I understand, there's two techniques here either to go to some morphology or you go to the, the structure of the material in molecular level? That's an excellent question. Excellent question. So you're saying whether a single polymer network is a good or just a, a organized uh, uh, things at a molecular level or organized uh, things at a higher level, at a fiber le level or lattice level. So my answer is uh, if you look at the nature uh, so uh, most tissues are actually composite. The organization is at a level higher than individual molecules. So maybe nature, just speculation, nature uh, doesn't have enough polymer to work with, but it has uh, many different kinds of making them together. But you also see that in technology, uh, the shortcoming of individual material is long appreciated. For example, our airplane now with uh, composites, with, uh, with a carbon fiber, which is very brittle material. And uh, then with a very soft matrix by comparison, the epoxy, let's say. Uh, so I believe it's the same principle. Epoxy allow stress deconcentration over long lengths of fiber. That material has to be fatigue resistance as well. Oddly, not much huge amount of literature on just study fatigue mechanism 
of these composites, uh, especially along the chain. So, but I think it's the same mechanism, has to be. So to answer your question in summary form, um, so both are good. Uh, they actually similar principles, but uh, because of the limitation of a material, single materials, maybe you have to do multiple materials to make a composite. Thank you. So we are going to have a final question from John Dasani, and then we have a certificate to present after that question. So, John. Hi, it's Jay Gong. Uh, great, great talk, as, as always. Uh, Kevin asked me to keep this short, so let me try. The, the gist of the question is, what opportunities do you see for mechanics in this realm? But the perspective is that, I think as you know well, in metals, you know, the metallurgists figured out how to make tougher and tougher materials. And that led to a lot of work in mechanics of looking at mechanisms of fracture, uh, particle debonding, void growth, shear localization. I believe in polymers as well, there's something a little bit analogous with looking at mechanisms of crazing and ways to enhance toughness through various techniques of polymer processing. So I wonder with these very soft materials, those were for tougher, poly harder, stiffer polymers, what opportunities do you see for mechanics in, in these class of problems? Yeah, so, uh, so for example, hydrogel is a relatively young material. The first synthetic hydrogel was reported in early 60s. It's, uh, John, the material is younger than you. <laughs> so, so <laughs> you're young. Uh, uh, so so uh, you, uh, many questions, even many traditional questions, for example, before Jian Ping Gong made her discovery, there were virtually no study of toughness of hydrogel itself. So forget about the mechanism, it's just no measurements, no number. So, and uh, just merely because she, she, by the way, was an electrical engineer, turned to a polymer engineer, and she by chance developed material feel different from other hydrogels in her lab. She studied it, then opened up a, a enormous field I regard myself as, as a person in her field. Uh, so uh, you just ask many questions. Uh, many questions are similar to metals, but I believe this uh, stress, for example, this uh, stress deconcentration idea is probably back in our head, but somehow didn't play a big role in our previous mechanics study. I don't know why. So maybe, I don't know. Uh, maybe for some of us, uh, uh, study composites with Tony and other people. We are very familiar with this idea, but this idea certainly was not talked about in plastics uh, or in metals. I believe this same idea can even make a metal tough and fatigue resistance. Just, yeah, just deconcentrated stress. Now, uh, going back to your soft material, soft material, uh, materials new, also the application is relatively new. So for the last uh, few decades, the principal application of hydrogel has been drug delivery and uh, tissue engineering. For drug delivery, the property, mechanical property requirements are typically low, uh, but getting serious because uh, you need to have adhesion perhaps uh, but now if you want to actually replace tissue, so recently we got involved in a project of trying to replace heart valve. To this day, heart valve, if you want to use a soft heart valve, you cannot really use synthetic material. You have to use a cow heart membrane. Uh, it has its own problems. So we try to say whether we understand enough to actually address that issue. So the short uh, way to answer your question is perhaps now we, uh, we need to find these uh, biologists or bioengineers as our metallurgists, learn what is their problem and translate their problem in the form mechanics people can understand. Then we can study them. 
Fatigue is a definite the problem for heart valve. All synthetic materials suffer fatigue, cannot be used as heart valve. There's no successful case, especially, so I need to qualify this. Uh, people probably know one or two cases that they could somehow do it, but uh, that with a lot of restrictions. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Yudong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. yeah, bioengineers are new metallurgists. We need to learn from their problems. So let's thank Professor Swo one, one more time for a lovely talk today. It was really fantastic to, to see all that work. Um, and we have one final thing. You know, this is a very special endowed and lecture in our department. And so we would like to present you with a certificate, uh, Qigong. Let me share my screen. We'll send you the real certificate in the mail. It's framed. And um, so if you get a large box on your, on your doorstep, don't be alarmed. It's just our certificate. Um, and I think you can see it. Um, I was unaware of the word Tanglemer when we, we came up with the citation, so or else I, I may have added it to it to um, help cement that word since you're pushing it. But um, So uh, it's our pleasure to present you with uh, this certificate in recognition of uh, you presenting the Dory Callanan Lecture. Um, the citation on the certificate, as everyone can read, it says, for major contributions to the understanding of the deformation and fracture of materials ranging from ceramic composites to soft hydrogels with applications ranging from stretchable electronics to artificial muscles. Um, and we saw some of this most recent work today. It's very impressive. And thank you again for, for giving this seminar today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, uh, the audience. Okay. And so that concludes our seminar. Um, I know, Zhigang, you're meeting with many people um, in the department, and we thank you for that. And so we'll have follow-up discussions, and hopefully you'll come to Philadelphia, and we'll be able to take you to dinner in celebration of this occasion uh, in the not-too-distant future. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.